A very warm welcome to the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show. And today's show is the Gold Gourmet, which captures the life of an English performer, professional football player who played in the Football League in the 1970s and 80s as a forward goal machine. He began his career at Doncaster Rovers after being spotted by manager Laurie McMenemy, and he went on to spend seven years there as a first team player. He went on to attract attention from higher divisions for several years, including spending time on trial at Bobby Robson's famous Ipswich Town at the time. Of course, great site they were then, before signing for Leighton Orient in the summer of 1977. Ever present in his first year at Orient, he finished as the club's top scorer with 21 goals, as well as scoring seven times in the FA Cup uh, at, as Orient reached the semi-finals, beating Chelsea and Middlesbrough along the way. We're going to talk about that Chelsea match, Peter, I can tell you that now. <laughs> so, yes, folks, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome on the show Peter Kitchen. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you, Russell. Pleasure to be here. Ah, so actually, the pleasure's all mine. It really is great to have you on the show. You've got such a rich history, really, playing football. And we will get on to that Chelsea match, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, it's always good to start at the beginning. You were born in Mexborough, West Riding of Yorkshire, where you attended Mexborough Grammar School and represented Yorkshire senior schools and England B teams. In fact, I uh, looked this up, actually. Mexborough is where a number of sports stars originate from, including Dennis Priestley, the two times world darts champion, who was on the show just a couple of weeks ago. Must be sank in the water, Peter, in Mexborough, I think, because quite a few stars come from there. However, you began your career at Doncaster Rovers, and after being spotted by Laurent Menemy, how did you how did all this come about, Peter? Well, I mean, I never really envisaged ever being a footballer at all. I mean, as a youngster, you know, yes. I'm talking about six or seven years old, I, I was a, a, a bit of an, a, an infant prodigy at football because I'd been playing with my brother, who was four years older than me and his mates. So I was pretty good at dribbling. And uh, and really, you know, we used to play with the old jumpers for goalposts, et cetera. And, um, you know, I, was, I naturally just seemed to, to become pretty good. And I went to junior school and at seven years old, I was selected for the under 11s team and ended up being captain for two or three years um, in you know junior junior school level and played for the district team. And then I, I sort of lost a little bit of interest in football as I got into my teens. And like most teenage boys, I was more interested in sampling Yorkshire bitter and and uh, <laughs> cider and and you know trying to chat girls up, finding girlfriends, etc. You know exactly normal <laughs> male, a normal male young lad. Sexual. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, uh, uh, my dad. I, I got to fifteen, sixteen. I'd, I'd done my O levels at school. Got six O levels, five CSE grade ones. Didn't know what to do. Uh, my dad, who's a coal miner, um, spent 40-odd 40, 40 years down the mines and had two or three years off to go and fight the Japanese in Burma. Oh, wow. Well, that's what he says, says it was. But uh, he was actually very brave, was a chindit, uh, working behind enemy lines. And it's only now I can realise how brave he was. The story there itself, isn't it, Peter? Yeah. Um, and then uh, in his broad Yorkshire accent, he said to me... Um, they're not going to out pit city that can get this and stay on at school and get this and a good education. They're a bright lad, you know. You got all these old these old levels. Get the A levels. Didn't know anything about what the A levels and O levels were were about really, but mm. just thought that that was the thing you had to do. So I went up to the grammar school. Um, within a couple of weeks, I was playing football and and. Uh, the sports master, a very, very, um, a wonderful sports teacher, um, Bob Bennett, he asked me if I fancied a, a game in the second 11. So I played a game, scored a hat trick. Following week, he asked me to play in the, the first 11. And from there, I, I sort of um, made the jump really from playing in the first 11 to playing for Yorkshire grammar schools. Um, and I had a couple of years playing for Yorkshire Grammar Schools and uh, and I actually played for England Grammar School B time. I, I didn't get in the first England squad, but I, I made the B squad. Um, and uh, we were 
we were on a, a, a school's um, football tournament in Skegness and uh, I played for the England B team, scored two goals against Derby County Youth. Uh, and there were several scouts there, Doncaster's uh, scout there, and uh, he recommended me to Laurie McMenemy, who contacted me, asked me if I'd like to join Doncaster Rovers youth team. Um, I said, well, yeah, I will, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing my A-levels at the moment and, uh, you know, I'm not, not going to leave school till I'm 18. And, um, and then he, he asked me if I'd like to go on a coaching course to Lillishaw. Wow. And what this, what this co coaching course was, it was, it was, we were about, uh, probably about 50 to 70 coaches, FA coaches, and they wanted a lot of boys to act as guinea pigs. And uh, I had a very good week there. And on the on at the end of the week, a few uh, clubs said to me, "Oh, you know, how you sign for anyone?" <laughs> I said, "Well, not really. I'm uh, I'm just here with Doncaster and sort of playing for the U team." Anyway, on the coach on the way back, Laurie McMenemy called me to the front of the coach and said. You've had a very good week, son, and um, I'd like to offer you a contract. Are you interested in signing for Doncaster? And I said, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, wow. yeah. didn't didn't know what I was going to do anyway. Um, and uh, so I, he said to me, well, I better speak to your parents first. And uh, I said, well, that, that you know, they just want me to be happy and to to follow what I want to do. He said, I don't care. I'm going to come and see them. And uh, he came to our house the following, about three or four days later, uh, with a contract. And uh, he turned up outside uh, the house in one of those old-fashioned racing green <laughs> Jaguars. Which, you know, which, you know, I'm knowing Mexico as it is now, the wheels wouldn't have been on it when he left. <laughs> <laughs> but in those days, you know, you, you never locked your, your car door and, and uh, you know, crime wasn't as, as like it is now. And um, I, he said, I'm going to offer you uh, £15 a week, £10 appearance money in the first team, £4 for a win, £2 for a draw, and we'll give you crowd bonus. Uh, wow. You know, as well, if you get more than 8000 you'll get this. And I thought, well, this sounds great. Um, he said, he'll also give you a signing on fee of £250, which was a sort of a, a regulation signing on fee. And they gave you 125 at the start of this season and 125 at the end. Anyway, so I said, God, this sounds yeah, great. I'm all right. And, uh, yeah. So I signed the contract. And about an hour later, there was a knock at the door. And... Uh, this this guy came to the door. He said, oh, "Can I speak to Peter Kitchen, please?" I said, uh, uh, "Yeah, that's me." He said, well, um, "He said I'm I'm from Leeds United. I'm chief scout from Leeds United. I'd like to sign you for Leeds United." He said, "He said, would you like to sign?" I said, "Oh, I've just signed for Doncaster Rovers." And he, <laughs> uh, with that, he just said, "Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I didn't know that. I can't I can't say any more to you then." And and that was it. So. Wow. I missed a great opportunity to have gone to the great lead side of, of um, I, may, I'm, I may, probably wouldn't have got in the first team for a, a couple of seasons, but it would have been a different start. Certainly would. To, to Doncaster. And, uh, and that, that was the start of my career. I was, I was 18 and, uh, you know, ready to, ready to go for it. Absolutely right. So that's a, a fabulous story. I mean, just missing out on Leeds United by literally, you know, a few moments really after signing for Doncaster Rovers. I mean, that's an incredible story in itself, Peter, isn't it really? Fantastic. But you did make your Doncaster Rovers debut at the age of 18 and scored after just two minutes, in fact, during a 3 0 win over Shrewsbury Town. And you scored again in your second game, this time in a 2 1 defeat to Swansea City. So you could say, you made an immediate impact and destined to become a crowd favourite, really. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd sort of... Doncaster, uh, uh, two seasons before, they'd won the, the old fourth division championship. Mm. Uh, and that's it. the season that I was playing, they um, were struggling and uh, they hadn't signed any players 
from getting promotion. And as normally when you don't, you know, you don't build on on the success and the momentum you've you've made, mm. um, you know, you start to struggle and players were getting older. And um anyway, so we were struggling near the bottom. We hadn't won away from home and uh I'd scored a few goals in the reserves and, and he said, Laurie McManamy said to me, you know, I'm going to give you your debut tonight. So we went to Shrewsbury and I couldn't believe it. I, you know, somebody knocked the ball through. Yeah. And instinctively I just volleyed it and it rocketed in, you know, and uh, we we ended up winning the game 3-0 and, and then the following week at home, we played Swansea City and uh, another time I was not through and I managed to drop my shoulder, beat beat the, the player and the keeper and rolled it into the net. And uh, they, they used to, Laurie McMenemy started saying to me, if you don't score within the first half, I'm going to bring you off. <laughs> <laughs> well, brilliant. But, but, so, yeah, I mean, and, and I had a, quite a good season. I wasn't, I wasn't picked every week, it was sort of, in and I ended up playing uh, about 13, 14 games from November when I made my debut to the end of the season and scored mm. uh, about six goals. So it was quite a, a decent return for my first season. Definitely. However, Absolutely. however, this the, the downside of it was that because the team was struggling and we got relegated, Laurie McManamy got the sack. Oh. And... Uh, we got a new manager in and and I was sort of dropped back down the, the, the list and took me I lost a couple of seasons really, mm. which which looking back now I realize um those sort of things really affect your development. Definitely. You know, you need to be when you're a young player, you need to be playing with better players and playing regularly, and that's how you, you progress more. Absolutely so, right. I couldn't agree more. And whilst at Doncaster Rovers as well, you played alongside a chap called Mike Elvis, forming a formidable strike partnership, actually. And in one of the biggest games in Doncaster Rovers history at the time, when Doncaster Rovers drew 2-2 with Liverpool uh, in the FA Cup at Anfield, I think in January 1974, with yourself, Peter, scoring one of those goals. And before losing 2-0 in the replay, I mean, what a match at Anfield. Please tell us more about that. To score at Anfield, it's a fantastic experience, isn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean... When we were drawn against Liverpool at Anfield, I don't think anybody, you know, could really believe it. Because I mean, to get to the third, the third round for a for a fourth division side yeah. is not easy anyway. Uh, but to then draw Liverpool, who were top of the first division, and we were actually bottom of the old fourth division, what's now League Two, mm. um, and no one expected us to to do anything. We had a lot of good young players, but we were. You know, we were a fairly raw side. We, you know, we were all learning our trade. And um, myself and Mike, I actually played wide on the left that game. And uh, Mike was playing down the centre with a guy called Brendan O'Callaghan, who mm. eventually him and I became uh, the part, the front partnership and did very well together. Um, and Kevin Keegan opened the scoring within within about 15 minutes and we thought oh, well, that's it you know <laughs> we expected to cave in but but five minutes later I think I equalized and then just before half time Brendan scored a goal to put us 2-1 up and I have to say that at half time the Liverpool fans gave us a standing ovation yes that's amazing um and but in the second half, we, it was like the siege of the Alamo. <laughs> and you know, expect really, yes. Kevin Keegan was, you know, one of one of my heroes at the time, and and he he scored an equaliser. And you know, they were they were bombarding us the whole of the second half. We were we were just getting behind the ball. Mm. And then in the last minute, someone knocked a long ball, hopeful punt forward, and I'm chasing it and. Ray Clements came out to, to collect it and Emily News is running back and they both wavered on who was going to get the ball. And I just kept running and I just stuck a toe out and the ball sailed over Ray Clements and it dropped onto the top of the crossbar, oh. bounced 
again on the crossbar and dropped down and Emily News got back and cleared it away. Oh. And, that, and that could have been probably one of the you know FA Cup shocks of all time, a bit like uh, Hereford and Newcastle. Um, Absolutely. 3-2 win uh, anyway, at Liverpool. It was, it was a fantastic experience in front of 30-odd thousand fans and uh, unfortunately we lost the uh, we lost the replay 2-0 which mm. was which was um, was played on a Tuesday afternoon um and and my great friend Terry Curran who I know has been on your show he has. He was playing as well and um it was it was played at two o'clock because it was the minus strike oh, and yes, so there was no you know there were all these power shortages and power outages on oh. a regular basis. Oh, I remember that. Oh dear. <laughs> so you know, twenty odd thousand in in Bellevue at Doncaster, but you know when you when you're playing the top side, you you only get one chance. You do usually, usually anyway, and, and you've got to take it. But fantastic experience. Oh, absolutely. And you made a very point, a poignant statement there, actually, Peter, as well, that the Liverpool fans gave you a standing ovation as you were leaving the pitch for, for, for you know, after the first half. In fact, I think Liverpool fans used to always do that back in the day. I'm not quite sure it's the same now, but they often, you know, recognised quality, didn't they, um, in, in terms of a player or a team? And that's an amazing thing to do, isn't it? Incredible. Yeah, well, I think I think they Liverpool fans appreciate... Um, you know, appreciate teams that are trying and giving their exactly. all. And, uh, you know, Liverpool were the best team in, in the country at the time. And you so, were bottom of the fourth division. So, yeah, absolutely incredible. So, yeah, it was it was a wonderful experience. And it probably gave me the confidence then. And I I then, as because shortly after that, I mean, the manager got sacked from him. <laughs> uh, Morris Setter. So I didn't really yes. get on well with um and he was replaced by Stan Anderson, who'd been manager at Middlesbrough and, uh, mm. and played for all the top northeast sides. And uh, that sort of gave me the confidence in myself. And uh, from then, I, I started, I was playing up front all the time and, you know, became a 20 odd goal a season man for the next yes. four seasons. So it was, great, it was a great, uh, you know, base to, to build on. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? That, uh, you know, a simple change, like a manager change, how it can uh, be good luck for you or bad luck. You know, it changes the environment, doesn't it? The dynamics can change instantly. Um, you know, whereas you were probably under Laurie Menemy, one of his favoured, you know, youngsters to go play. And he would have played you more often, wouldn't he? There's no doubt about that. Oh, um, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, some players don't need... Um, you know, managers to be to give them the confidence. They go mm. out there, sort of. You know, I've heard Graham Sooners say on Sky. You know, yeah. I didn't need the manager to like me or anything like that. I just went out and did that. But we're not all the same. No. And sometimes you need an arm around you and a bit of encouragement and to give you confidence. And and Stan Anderson coming in for me was was a brilliant thing because he just gave. He used to say to the team, you know. Every time you get 30, 40 yards from goal, look to play in Peter because he'll get he'll score for you. Brilliant. And you know, from there it just it, you know, and it was true. And I ended up scoring you know, 25, 27, you know, goals a season. It was uh, and it was and it made a big difference to me. I I finally believed in myself, shall I say. Absolutely. And of course, you were also starting to attract attention from the higher divisions for several years, including spending time on trial at Bobby Robson's Ipswich Town before signing for Leighton Orient in the summer of 1977. So tell us more about your experience with Bobby Robson. What a great man he was, wasn't he? And your oh. trial at Ipswich Town. Then, of course, your decision, to, the decision, I should say, to sign for Leighton Orient. Well, yeah, it's um, it was it was a, a, a brilliant experience, but it ended up being a very sad, sad occasion in a sense. But... Mm. Um, I, it was the end of the, the coming up to the end of the 76 77 season. My contract, I'd refused to sign a new contract because I wanted to play higher level football. Mm. Um, and the chief scout at Ipswich had been watching me, and and they they wanted me to go on on a trial for a, three or four weeks to the end of the season. And uh, the first team, the first team had more or less finished, I think they finished third in the, the old first division. 
and uh, they they'd gone off for a, a week or two to the Middle East to play a couple of exhibition games. So I played um, I played a reserve game, uh, funnily enough, against one Cardiff City, who I later played for. And then when the first team came back, I played in a couple of um, testimonial games. I think one was at Cambridge or, or Ch Chelmsford or somewhere like that. And I scored a couple of goals. And Bobby Robson called me in on the Friday, the last night uh, before I was going to leave to, to drive back to uh, Doncaster and uh, said that I'd done very well. And he, he wanted to know how much he thought Doncaster would want for me. I said to him, uh, well, in the paper, they're saying they want 70,000. But in reality, I think they'll accept 50. And he said, he said, well, he said, I was thinking more of 25. <laughs> and I it. said, well, I don't think they'll accept that. He said, well, leave it with me. I'll see what I can do. He said, but he said, I can't even promise you a game in the reserves. So I can't, I can't up it very much. He said, I've got Weimar, Mariner and Woods in the first team. I've got Brazil, Alan Brazil, Eric Gates. Um, what side that was. <laughs> yeah. He said, I've got those two, um, Keith Birchin. Yes. And David Geddes, who's on loan at uh, Luton, I think it was, or Aston Villa. Um, so he said, I can't even promise you a game in my reserve, son. He said, and these lads are 21 and you're 24, 25. Um, and to which he said, but leave it with me. I'll see what I can do with them. I'll speak to Stan Anderson. Apparently, they he offered 28,000, but Doncaster wouldn't wouldn't come down and uh and then i i um i got the offer a few weeks later to go to lake orient and then i was a bit reluctant to i didn't want to move down to london mm. you know, i was on the list on the transfer list it was common knowledge because my contract was up and i said i don't mind where i go as long as it's not london i don't <laughs> know why because now I live down here. I love it. But yes, yeah, strange, you know, isn't it? At the time, I didn't really. I, you know, it 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 was a big big jungle down here, and I thought <laughs> I don't know if I could settle. And um, so I, I ended up having three visits to come down and talk terms. And they kept we kept negotiating on the contract, and I kept saying, "No, I'm I don't want three years. I might not settle. I'll be homesick." Um, you know, I don't want, I want more money than what you're offering me. I don't know if I can afford to live down here. You know, all yes. the usual uh, pragma practical things you have to consider. Definitely. Um, and um, on the third, the third visit, they agreed to everything I'd asked for. And they said, look, we've, we'll give you everything you've asked for. Will you, will you sign? We'll really look after you here. And I said, Okay, I'll sign. And we shook hands on it. Shook hands with George Petty, who was the manager, and uh, Brian Winston, who was the chairman. And I went back on the train that to, to Doncaster. And when I got back, I got a phone call from Stan Anderson. And he said, oh, how did it go? I said, yeah, well, I, you know, he said, have you signed? I said, well, I haven't signed yet, but I'm going to. I, I, you know, I've shaken hands with the chairman on that. And uh, he said, only we've had another offer that's come in and it's, it's matched Lake Orient's offer. And I said, well, who is it? He said, well, you know, I'm not going to tell you because you've already agreed to sign. I said, look, I've shaken hands on it. I had this old fashioned, you know, yes. I suppose mor morality that, you know, if you shake hands and agree as a gentleman's agreement. Absolutely. And um, he said, oh, yeah, we've had a, an offer from Keith. Keith Birkinshaw at Tottenham, oh. um, and uh, they they've matched what Oriental paying. And I said, well, I was gutted, but I said, well, you know, that's I've shaken hands. I can't I can't go back on my word. And uh, 
so that that I signed for Leighton Orient, as it, you know, and that was it. The touch of deja vu there, isn't there, Peter? Really, it was Leeds United just before, uh, just after you signed for Doncaster. You've made an agreement, you know, gentleman's agreement, shaking hands for Leighton Orient, and of course, then Tottenham Hotspur come along. I mean, what a story! It's great, isn't it? But well, you know, I think I think I mean it was a different time back in and a different time, you know, in the seventies and to now, and also there were no agents. Mm. Uh, I had no one really to advise me. My dad was a, was a lovely man, but he didn't. He wasn't into high level contract negotiations or anything, mm. you know. And uh, and I was basically on my own and making these decisions. And uh, you know, I just felt that I couldn't go back on my word. And and um, you know, I, I, I sometimes think what would have been, you know, because to play with players like Glenn Hoddle and who I, th you know, was one of my favourite players of all time. Of course, yeah. Um, you know, the 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 quality of the balls that you get and and the service you get from these, and and especially as we know, Tottenham were then one of the great attacking sides of of that era. Absolutely, um, they were. Yes. I, you know, I I signed for Leighton Orient, and and as it happens, it turned out to be a very successful move. Certainly did. I mean, your abilities as a football player, Peter, were respected and feared, actually, throughout the Championship um, and the lower divisions of the English Football League for over, over a decade. And it is said by many you should have played in the Premiership, and you almost did, with you know Leeds United, of course, and, and Tottenham Hotspur, or First Division it was back then today, of course. But you never got the, your lucky break, ultimately, although those breaks could have been there, but for you know, reasons we've just discussed, and never offered the chance. You certainly had the ability, Peter. So what is your feeling here? You just sort of touched on it. Obviously, you would have liked to play in the highest domestic level, wouldn't you? And uh, missed out on both Leeds United and Tottenham through reasons. Yeah, of well, I, I mean, what, contracts. in essence, when I, you know, when you look at things in a, in a sort of a cold light of day, mm. um, some of it was timing. As I mentioned earlier, Russell, you know, you need to get the moves at the right time. You do when you're younger, um, and when you're when you're doing when you're being very successful at a football club, they don't want to they don't want to get rid of you. You know, I mean, I was not only was I you know scoring goals regularly, but I was a very good professional. I rarely got injured. Yes, I trained. I rarely missed training. You know, if I had a flu, I'd still go in and train. You know, and when you're a good professional, managers don't want to sell you. No. And they price me out of the mark out of the transfer market on many occasions, you know. I mean, when I when I signed for Lake Orient and I was doing very well, we played Norwich City in the FA Cup, uh, third round. We drew one all at, at home and I scored the goal. We played Norwich City in the replay away and I scored and we beat Norwich. Mm. Straight after the game, I was told that um, John Bond, who was the manager, offered one hundred and forty thousand pound cash for me. Wow! And um, Orient asked for two hundred and fifty thousand. That was the price that they were suggesting. And obviously, you know, Norwich weren't going to do that. They ended up signing, um, oh, what's his name, the the one of the brothers, the the black lad. Um, coloured lad. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's escaped me as well now. The the so scored the goal of the season. Yeah, against so, Liverpool, wasn't it, as well? Yeah. That was against Liverpool at Norwich yeah. City, Carrow Road, wasn't it? Fantastic yeah, well, goal. He, he came through and, and, and so that never followed on, you know. And uh, I also was, was tapped up by uh, Terry Venables. Mm. Um, I know it was illegal as such, but one day I was driving into pre-season at the end, at end of that first season I was there and uh, he was in his car next to mine at the traffic lights and we, he told me to pull over and asked me if I, if I knew that he'd made an offer for me. And I said, uh, no, I don't, I don't hear anything like that. They, they never tell me anything. It's always in the paper um, that there's someone, you know, there's someone looking at you or interested in signing you, but... Mm. They never seemed to materialise. Anyway, he said, I've offered um, a player plus £110,000 for you. Um, 
but Jimmy Bloomfield's turned it down and they want 250,000 for your cash, or they'll accept 100,000 and Vince Hilaire. <laughs> and Vince Hilaire was, you know, was going to be the next Laurie Cunningham and the next, you know, the next top, top player. So, you know, again, they, the, the transfers never materialise because of the, the cost involved. Yeah, and, uh, you know, pricing it up so they can't sell you. So that's a way of keeping you at the club, isn't it, really? Because they, yeah. they want you there. They want you to do Orient, Orient to play football. And it was, it was fashion you, wasn't it, that scored that cracking that's goal? The one, yeah, just in yes, fashion. Just in fashion you. Yeah. And uh, cracking goal he scored against Liverpool, goal of the season. I do remember that. It's brilliant. Uh, yeah, so, again, another opportunity. These opportunities do, do come along, and it was a different day uh, going back uh, in, in the time of football then. Tapping up did happen. We know that all the time. <laughs> but you were ever present in your first year at Orient in, in 1977-78 and finished as the club's top scorer of 21 goals. I think it was 21 goals. I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. As well as scoring seven times in the FA Cup as Orient went on to reach the FA Cup semi-finals, beating Chelsea and Middlesbrough along the way. I mean, that's some start to your footballing career at Orient, really, isn't it, Peter? 21 goals, first season, you know, iconic yeah. Peter Kitchen at Orient. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, in total, it was 29 because I scored a League Cup goal as well. Ah, but, OK. You know, they, they, they don't always seem to count the Cup goals, but scored 21 League goals in 42 games. Um, yeah, and I mean, I, I, I was so desperately trying to prove that I could play at the highest level. And, you know, we were playing against top sides like Tottenham, who'd been relegated the season before. Yes. Um. And and Orient weren't renowned as a side that scored a lot of goals. You know, I think I think even that season we were the second lowest goal scorers in the league. Um, so you know, goal scoring goals in a team that's struggling and not doing that well is is a lot more difficult than when you're playing in a side that's, that's winning games. Um, but so it was, you know, it was a phenomenal game and a phenomenal season. And uh, definitely, yeah, I mean. But it was it was a great club to play for in the sense that that there were a really good set of lads. There were no egos, you know. It was like a Cinderella club in a sense, like yes. and and everyone's second club, you know. You, if you're a Spurs fan, you can't support Arsenal or West Ham or Chelsea. Yes, you know. So, um, but it was a wonderful it was a wonderful friendly club, and it helped, and that helped me to to settle down south to the point that I said after three or four months, I never wanted to move back up north. <laughs> oh, um, brilliant. But, That's, you know, uh... when, when we played in the FA Cup, um, you know, we, we weren't doing so well in the league. We were in the bottom half of the league. But in the FA Cup, there was a different mindset, you know. We, mm. um, well, Jimmy, Jimmy Bloomfield didn't, was the manager. And I mean, I didn't, you know, I'm not going to talk ill of Jimmy because he he was the sort of manager that that um, he liked experienced players, and he he didn't do a lot of coaching. Um, whereas some you get some coaches, some managers that that want to improve players and young players and bring them through. Yes, but Jimmy was also ill. He was suffering from bowel cancer. Oh, and so sad. He, you know, very, very sad. I mean, he died in 1983. Oh, sad. Um, and we only found out as the season went on just how bad his his illness was. Mm. Um, but he he so he missed quite a few games, and um, the assistant Peter Angel, who'd been a was a lovely man, and uh, he'd been at QPR for a, all most of his career, was a mm. a real. I really he encouraged you. He was very positive and always encouraged you to go forward and to try and to try and attack. And we were playing. We'd drawn with Chelsea at, at home, nil nil, and That's uh, right. And the wall collapsed, and uh, you know <laughs> there were no no serious injuries. I was at the game actually, Peter. To be honest, at Brisbane Road. All oh, right. Um, yeah. Well, I think Jack. I scored a goal that was disallowed, and then late on in the game, Jacko. John Jackson, the goalkeeper, he pulled off a phenomenal save and it, it ended nil-nil. And no one expected us to to win the replay at Chelsea. Um, and in the first half, I was getting kicked to death by <laughs> Chopper Harris. You know, was, <laughs> You'd expect was, that against Chopper. Yeah, 
<laughs> and uh, he was just following me around. And every time the ball came to me, he would come through the back of me. And uh, <laughs> I was at the game. And, I remember it well. And uh, and then Bill Roffey, our fullback, scored an on goal uh, just before half time. And we went in at half time, and I think we were all a bit down. And Peter just said, "Look, lads, go out there and." You know, give it your all, have a go. There's no point worrying about it. You, mm. you know, you can do it. And and it was like a different team came out. You know, um, if, if it had been around as much, you'd have think that some we'd all been snorting cocaine because the second half we were just phenomenal. I can oh, assure you we hadn't been, by the way. And um, you know, I scored a couple of really good goals, and and it was a it it sort of plat it almost platformed the team. Suddenly, clubs were starting to look at our players. Yes, they gosh, they've got some really good players. This team, you know, people like like Glenn Roder uh, and and Phil Hoadley, who recently died. You know, yes, uh, uh, and they both went on from there and played in the first division. You know, Tony Grealish, who later went to Brighton and mm. played in the cup final, and had a, a number of good clubs. So all of a sudden, from having this struggling team, people started to take note of the players. And it was really, it, it was a great atmosphere at the club. You know, well, so, I think mean, that showed in the second half at Stamford Bridge. Because so I, I was a very young Chelsea supporter at the time. So I, like most Chelsea fans back on that day, were thinking, well, we're going to get through this quarterfinals. Here we come. Of course, it didn't happen. And... But I have to say, you scored both of Orient's goals that day, didn't you? I seem to remember. One of which was a mesmerising run into the penalty box, I think gliding past some uh, three or four Chelsea players before slotting the ball home past Peter De Benetti, the late and great Peter Benetti, of course. I mean, that was some goal, Peter, and really akin to Ricky Villiers' goal in 1981 FA Cup final replay at Wembley. That was a tremendous goal you scored there, wasn't it? Fantastic. Yeah, um, yeah I think when, when you... Um, I mean, as a goal scorer, I was always an instinctive goal scorer. You know, it's uh, yeah. sometimes you can't you can't explain what you do and why you did it at that particular time. And and the ball was knocked out down the down the right hand side towards the edge of the box, and I s turned inside um, Chopper Harris. I think for once I got away from him. Yes. And then Mickey Droy came steaming in. You know, six foot four of <laughs> and. Uh, Muscle I dropped my bone. shoulder and, I, and he went skating by and I, sh I was ready to shoot. And then all of a sudden I saw Ian Britton coming on the left-hand side out of the corner. So instead of I dummy to shoot and, and he went steaming by as well. So <laughs> it was really just, you know, dropping my shoulders and, and they all bought the dummy. Yes, and, they certainly did. Let me just with, with Peter Bonetti to, to put it past, but, yeah, I mean, it was a, it's a wonderful experience, and and uh, it's it's one of the funny enough, having scored over two hundred goals, it's one of the few that's actually been captured for posterity. Oh, had a great goal to be captured too, and I can remember you literally turning after slotting past Peter Vanetti to go two one up. I can remember um, you running up that middle of the field. You were you were like a I don't know, full of pure excitement. Uh, enthusiasm and your arms were all over the place. All your the other players were steaming around you. I mean, what a great goal and a, a great, exciting, um, you know, way to score. And of course, to celebrate at the same time, it's fantastic, Peter. I mean, I was a Chelsea fan. I was depressed at the time, but you know, you've got to say that was an absolutely fantastic goal and a great well, performance I think, by Orange. I think in those days, players were much more reserved in their celebrations. Yes. And, you know, I mean, Alan Shearer just, you know, yeah. in the 80s, Alan Shearer just used to put one arm up. and He did. But you Alan, weren't reserved, were you, on that goal? <laughs> the same, you know. Yes. I mean, I, I sort of tended to copy those and not, you know, copy Alan Clark and not really show much, mm. you know, emotion and just say, well, that's another goal, blah, you know. <laughs> not being arrogant, but you just go, that's another goal. Well, and uh, More than just a goal, that was. That was just incredible. Yeah, so, you know, so I mean, when it went in, I think I just couldn't believe it myself. I think you know, I had to close my mouth. If if they'd been warm, I'd have probably caught a few flies in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a cold old evening, wasn't it? Stanford Bridge that night it was quite quite chilly, but yeah, but that's fantastic. And Orient were through to the quarterfinals. I mean, it just it just beggars belief, doesn't it? And, and fantastic too, because you performed very well that year. Um, and 
you know, just a wonderful, wonderful cup run, wasn't it? I think you lost to Arsenal three, three nil, was it in the semi finals? Yeah, what we, a great we, cup run. Yeah, we we drew. Um, we played Middlesbrough, we got That's Middlesbrough it. in the sixth round, and at, at um, Ayrson Park, and I don't think any of us really fancied, you know, a trip up there. And I know that oh. the supporters that I've spoken to since were terrified because Middlesbrough had a terrible reputation in mm. terms of fighting and and beating up, you know, travelling fans. And um, I don't think any of us really looked forward to it. But when we no. went there, we, we just, I think everybody got behind the ball and we just tried to get a draw. And fortunately, you know, it worked. You know, they missed a couple of chances to have, to have won the game, we hardly got out of our half, <laughs> but we got the we got the game back at um, at Brisbane Road, and uh, I you know I I scored a goal I think after about six minutes with an overhead kick from from just out on the edge of the box, which wow. you know was another one of those instinctive goals that is you know you don't score very often, um, and and Big Joe, who was my striking partner, Joe Mayo, he scored a, a second one and. And then, you know, we, we were holding on in the second half because Middlesbrough were trying to get back and they got a goal back. But we, we held on and got through to the semi-finals for the first time in the club's history. Brilliant. Brilliant cup um, run. And I, I think we were all hoping we'd get West Brom because there was, there was Ipswich, uh, Arsenal and West Brom. And we were all hoping we'd get West Brom because we thought we'd have the best chance against them yes. getting something. But unfortunately, we drew Arsenal, and uh, on the on the day, everybody thinks we froze, but I don't think we did. We went out there um, with the intent on just st staying in the game as long as possible, and hoping mm. that we would grow into the game. Yes, maybe you know I'd get a chance to nick a goal, or you know we'd get a free kick, and somebody had head one in, or you know, and um, you know we 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 really. We're up for it, but we just couldn't, you know, we were we were under lots of pressure. And then Malcolm McDonald scored two goals, or claimed two goals that were, were that were deflections. Mm. Uh they were going out. It wouldn't have even hit the hit the target, but they bounced off two of our defenders into the goal. And when you're two nil down against a club like Arsenal, mm. um, you know, you, you it's not easy to get back. You know, you're chasing, chasing trying to climb a mountain and and it was a, it was just a bit too far for us to to get back in it. But it was a, it was a wonderful experience, and and uh, you know what a fantastic season. You know, what? personally, I, I had a you know I won goal of the season, player of the year, um, Daily Mirror Footballer of the Month, Evening Standard Footballer of the Month. You know, for me personally, it was a it was a wonderful um, pinnacle, really, of my of my career. Definitely. Absolutely right there, Peter. I mean, moving forward, it's quite a poignant thing to say. Moving forward a few years to 1999, you were voted by fans of both Doncaster Rovers and Leighton Orient as one of their greatest ever players. And in more recent polls conducted by BBC Football Focus, 442 Magazine and other popular fanzines, you were voted as one of the best players at both clubs, with some of those polls taking more than 20 years after you played for them. It's incredible, isn't it? And even today, you're still considered a cult hero amongst both sets of fans. I mean, that in itself, Peter, it tells a great footballing story, doesn't it? I mean, how does this make you feel? I mean, you must be honoured, I'm sure. Oh, definitely. I mean... In any in any job, you you want to be appreciated. Yes, you do. Um, and uh, to to have had so much success at, at two of the clubs I played for, and to be so well thought of is you know is is wonderful, really. I mean, you know, I've been voted into the Hall of Fame at both of those clubs. Quite um, rightly so too. You know, and and um, at Doncaster, they've got a, a big picture of me behind the goal. And they've named one of their bars after me, and at Orient they've named one of the tower blocks after me, and a and a bar, um, in the ground. So, you know, you can think, well, yeah, maybe I, if I'd have gone to Tottenham, I, you know, I think I would have done well, but, mm. but I probably might not have had the accolades that I did have by playing, you know, at, at Orient and Doncaster and. 
And, you know, at the end of the day, you all we are have is memories. And so you can exactly. look back and feel very happy with your contribution, you know, in that respect. Yeah, and those memories, those moments, no one can take them away, can they, really? And uh, you certainly had a, a very rich life uh, in football at those those two clubs. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. And I saw, I think, a Facebook, one of your social media Facebook uh, posts uh, just recently where you were at, uh, at Doncaster Rovers for an end-of-the-season match, or it might have even been the playoff semi-final. I, I can't remember. And you are definitely epitomised around the ground and in complete glory. There, there is a large picture of you, as you say, behind one of the goals. I mean... That's fantastic. That's some accolade, Peter, isn't it? Really, for a club to to look at you and and, and bring that into the into the ground like that from all those years ago. That's incredible, really. It's an incredible journey. Yeah, I think you know to, to when you think it's it's sort of forty odd years since I played for both clubs. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it, it, it's um, it makes you feel very proud. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. And, uh, and you know, sure. I, went, I went up to Doncaster only last week to see the you know, second leg of the playoff final, and yes. you know, I was a guest of the of the former chairman, and uh, you know, he, we were we were talking funnily enough, and he was saying because he was chairman for fifteen years, and uh, John Ryan, and he took the mm. club, bought the club when they got when they uh, got relegated from the football league, and he took them all the way back up the leagues to the championship in his 15-year tenure. Yes. And, you know, he said, you know, you and Alex Jeffrey are my my heroes. Wow. And that must have been the Facebook post, social media social media post I saw of you being at Doncaster Rose I mentioned earlier on. And uh, that's that's fantastic, isn't it, to be invited back by the then chairman? You know, yeah. And, a... and, it, it, well, yeah, and I mean, it, you know, Fans still come up to you and say, "Oh, you were my hero," and can I have a photo? And wonderful. You know, and it's uh, yeah, you, you know, you you can't really. Um, well, you, I mean, you must enjoy that sort of. Anybody would enjoy that sort of adulation, really. Oh, uh, I quite agree. I quite know, agree. And, and I mean, I I don't lo lose sight of, um, you know, where you come from and and that, and it's it's just a. a very nice to, to have been uh, recognised in that way. Quite right, too. And long may you continue to be, to be recognised, too. I'm sure I get many invites back. Do you ever go back to Orient at all, Peter? Do they invite you back? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I spend a, quite a, I go to quite a few games. Um, I, I do an online um, match preview. Oh, um, brilliant. I've been doing for about six or seven years now, um, and, a, and a match report. But it's not it's not like um a journalist report saying, you know, so and so scored this in this this minute and and that. I tend to focus on the sort of intangible things about a game, you know, the yes. psychological, uh, or what systems they were playing, whether or not the the, the managers they agree the players agree with the managers' tactics, you know, the things that, that are not necessarily so readily obvious when you when you're watching a game. You know. no, I quite agree. You have to invite me along. I'll come down and come down and watch a game with you, or in that'd be a fantastic yeah. thing to do. Um, yeah, I mean, it, well, I mean, a lot of managers, you know, a lot of sorry, a lot of fans fans will say, um, you know, after a game, they'll say, "Oh, the players weren't trying. The players weren't, you know, they're not, they're mm. end of seasons here already. They're not, they're not bothered." And I've never really known a professional football and not to try and not no. to give his all. And when it's when that's happening, I always say to them, I don't agree with that. I think what you'll find is they probably don't believe in the way the manager's playing or mm. the tactics is in 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 you know imposing on them and asking exactly. them to play. And I I think you know a lot of footballers know a lot more about the game without realizing it. Yes. And you instinctively know when you're in a team whether you're whether you're playing the right way or not, you know, I, I can remember. I can remember an incident when I was at at Fulham, and uh, I'd signed for Fulham, and uh, we were playing. We were playing. Um, I think it was Cambridge away, and I didn't. I didn't. I, it was a big mistake going to Fulham because the manager and the vibe at the club wasn't the same as at Orient, and and the manager I didn't really 
like at all. He, he, he you know, in my opinion, I say this, he, he was a bully. Yes. And he was he, he was he'd been put into a job that he wasn't good enough to to do. It's my opinion that you know, so um we're all entitled to our opinions, I Peter. Saying, I don't mind saying that, but you exactly. know, we were, we were playing Cambridge United in this game. We'd only been there three weeks, and I wasn't I hadn't really settled into the team and um we were we got absolutely hammered in the first half against Cambridge. Um, and it was 3 0 at half time. And the, as the players came in, they're all a bit, you know, heads down and that, you know, because we're um, we never could get close to Cambridge. They were knocking long balls in, they mm. were pressurizing us. And the manager went round every single player. And he he verbally abused each one with his finger in their face, oh. uh, and swearing at them and threatening them and every single player in the team, and you know, in say came to me and he said, "And you, yeah, you know, swearing at me, you think you've arrived? Well, you know, you haven't. You'll be out of the team if you don't get your finger up." And and. We went out the second half and we ended up losing 4 0. They scored one. And after that, I thought, you know, because I used to be a, a deep thinker about football. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and I, I thought, well, that is not the way to lift players and manage players. You Definitely know, not. Everybody needs occasionally a kick up the backside, but it's how you do it. Of course it is. And, uh, and, now, if it, if I was faced with that situation, I would have stood up to him and you know and said, "You're talking a lot of crap." Have you thought it might be the way you're playing the team and how you've picked the team and set it up? Yeah, bad but, tactics. Well, you know, yeah, yeah, and and that's the thing about football is that during the era that we played, managers weren't as as uh, how can I say as open minded and as mm -hmm. and as um, modern thinking as they a lot of them are now you know with the influx of foreign coaches and that you can you know there's a lot of uh there's a lot more insight and and that you know in football and and how you play but you know it's 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 it, it, that's just another rich uh, life's rich uh experiences really of course it is and of course they say that you struggle to find form at fulham which is probably not the case. You struggled to work with the tactics of the manager and to deal with the manager. And of course, your second year at Fulham, um, you had suffered with a series of injuries, which saw you miss most of the season anyway. And Fulham were, were eventually relegated and you moved to Cardiff City. Yeah, I mean, the second season there, I, I only missed, I was only injured at the start of the season. Oh, OK. Um, and I was out for about three or four weeks. And during that time, um, Gordon Davis, who went on to become Fulham's record goal scorer, came yes. into the team and did very well. And you know, good luck to Gordon. You know, he's he, a good player, he, wasn't he? He's was a good player, and and that. But the the team was still struggling, and mm. they got relegated at the end of that season. And I played the whole season in the reserves when I got fit, and I think I scored about thirty four or thirty five goals. And he wouldn't even pick me on the bench. You know, my relationship with the manager had broken down to such an extent mm. that you know he he just basically wrote wrote me out. Yeah, and terrible, to terrible. This day, he never we never actually spoke. He never actually called me in his office and explained why or anything. A bad manager, bad coach, bad manager. Clearly not not suitable for. Uh, oh, um, but so but you know so I I went to Cardiff. Um, uh, to continue my career, I thought Cardiff would be. It was Cardiff is probably the biggest of all the clubs I played for. Mm. You know, potentially they, you know, they would. Although Fulham are in the, the Premier League now, I mean Cardiff were in the Premier League about ten years ago. They and were indeed. They they could get easily thirty five, forty thousand. You know, yeah, it's big club. Yeah, you know, big club and and that. But off the field, there was a lot of. Um, there was a lot of wrangling in the boardroom and financially there was a lot of problems in football at the time. Yes, no, absolutely. I enjoyed my first season. I ended up top scorer with 19 goals. But the second season, I think we had a turnover of about five or six managers. 
so I I sort of asked to cancel my my three year contract and I left at the end of that season, and uh, Cardiff got relegated. I did indeed that year, and I did indeed. I mean, you did also score five times in a six 0 win over Cardiff Corinthians in the Welsh Cup. I I've read about as well. So you did end up with nineteen goals in all competitions as Cardiff City uh, yeah. and that season. Just avoided relegation too. So. Your 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 renowned goal scoring prowess, you could say, had returned at Cardiff City, Peter. It got yeah, you back yeah, in I the mean, game. I, I never doubted that I I couldn't score goals, and even in sides that weren't playing particularly well. Yes, you you you, you instinctively know that what positions to take up, um, and it's certainly a lot easier when you're playing with good players. That you know, I mean, I don't know if you saw the game the other night with Man City. At Tottenham, um, you know, and and you see Erling Haaland, I and mean, he hardly had a touch. And his first goal was from about three yards, and all he had to do was side foot it in because yeah. of the players around him. Just made, made the space and made you know the passes were superb. And this was clearly unmarked, wasn't he? In that six yard box, yeah. and uh, I mean, easy to play, in, play with players like that. Yeah, you know, makes such a difference. Huge difference. Huge difference. Incredible, really. Um, you know, that's really quite an incredible thing to do. I mean, it reminds me, actually, of Alan Clark of Leeds. He was that gold sniffer type, wasn't he? But yeah. he had great players around him at Leeds, too. So it's a, it is a team effort, isn't it, that makes the player, really, who scores the goals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, the service that you, you get is, is you know, it's vitally important. You know, you, you need to have certain types of players. You need to have width and, 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 wide, and wide players and that take people on, you know, exactly. you've got to have a lot of running off the ball. There, there are so many things that that make you score, you know, oh. that create chances to score goals. I used to find that managers would always be saying to me what I wasn't doing, yes, not what I was doing, you know, whether it's that that negativity, that mindset, instead of, you know, where where some of the managers I had were would be, be critical all the time of saying, yeah. you know, yeah, you scored two, but you should have you should have been doing this and you should have been doing that, you know. And that's not good tactics either, is it? That's bad, bad management, really. Well, I, mean, I think management is about getting the best out of the players you've got. Of course. Because you can't, you know, not every team can go out and, and buy 10 Ronaldos or, you know, <laughs> messes. And you have to you have to work with what you have. Exactly. And get the best get the best out of them. So being negative really is quite a bad thing, isn't it? You've got to lift them up as well a bit, really. You know, it's all right saying, you know, improve your game by doing this, this and that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, oh, you had a great game, Peter, today. Well done. Great two goals. You want to hear that, don't you? you really yeah. Do. Oh, yeah, definitely. Crikey. And then after leaving uh, Cardiff City, you had a short spell with Hong Kong side Happy Valley before returning to play once again for Leighton Orient in 1982-83. Where you made another forty-nine league appearances in your second spell with the London club. So, what was it like to return to Leighton Orient? The fans must have been delirious, surely. The great <laughs> Peter yeah. Kitchen has returned. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, I mean, Orient were in a in a dire position when I came back, mm. um, and uh, they were about. I think it was about twelve points adrift at the bottom of League One. Oh wow! And. Um, I was I was I came back and I asked them to train because it's I lived in Epping at the time so it's quite close, and while well, I got my international clearance, mm. and I was training with them and uh, Ken Knighton was the manager and asked me if I'd if I'd want to sign again so, you know I didn't really have as met that many options um, so it it was very suitable for me to re-sign and uh, I signed in in. December and the week before I played on this Friday night against Preston and we were drawing one all and there were about five minutes to go and I got I got the ball got knocked through and I, I managed to run onto it and round the keeper and slot it into the empty net and we won the game 2-1 um, and I think there were only about two and a half thousand there wow. which showed you how bad the support was Yes. But from then on, we we won six on the trot and got out of the bottom four before I broke my toe and 
and was out for about six or seven games. But I came back for the last few and scored in our last game. To We had to beat Sheffield United to stay up and, and we did and, and stayed in the, the league. So it was almost like a rescue, another rescue act in sense of, <laughs> you know, stopping them from going, getting relegated because when I was at, Doncaster, when I was at uh, Orient in my first spell, the last game of the season, we had to beat Cardiff City to stay in the championship. And I scored the goal and we beat them 1-0. So, oh, yeah. you know, I kept, I kept Orient in the championship and I also kept them in League One um, in, bo- you know, in both spells. So yes. I'm sure that's part of why I was so um, popular at the club. Oh, I'm sure it's not just those 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 seasons or those games. It's probably the whole of the time, the whole tenure at Orient, you know, including that FA Cup run to the semi-finals. Uh, yeah, I mean, you you are literally an icon. So that's just great, isn't it? And like, and then like most professional footballers at the end of their footballing playing career, which yours was about to become, you then went to play uh, major indoor soccer league football with Las Vegas Americans. I mean, how was your time in the USA, Peter? A lot of players go, don't they? Yeah, I, th- I mean, it was a new, it was a new event, a, a new adventure. Really, I'd had a few few offers um, to stay in England. Harry Redknapp asked me if I wanted to go to Bournemouth, um, but I thought that you know, going to America was like a real opportunity. And I thought maybe I can, I might get a coaching job. I might decide to, you know, sometimes you get these opportunities, uh, and it was a it was a whole new adventure, really. And it was uh, it was a fantastic experience, and I think I was fitter at at thirty two <laughs> playing there than I've been all my career. Wow! It was, you know that they had all the, you know, all the technology and and that 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 we have now. They already had it mm. back in those days. I mean the the um, the the doctor who was in charge of the team, I think, was a guy called Keith Clevin, who was Muhammad Ali's doctor. Wow, which gives you a, an idea of the level of competence that they definitely they had in terms of that. So it was it was a fantastic experience, and and part of the um, part of the contract was that every week three or four of us had to go down to this local park and coach some of the the kids. You know, and they used to yeah. have these open day open day coaching schemes, and I never saw as many girls coming to play football, little girls come to play football as I did then. And and so, you know, that's going back 40 years and now you can see the growth of football. You know, it's almost like seeing it at at its infancy and then seeing how it's developed now. Um, Well, ladies football in America is huge, isn't it? I mean, they're, 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 you know, what's still world number one football, the ladies in America. I mean, they're a top side, aren't they? That that shows it really. Um, Yeah. All that nurturing of, as you say, the young ladies starting to come along and play football all those years ago. Fantastic. That's good to see. I mean, even after your retirement from the professional game, you played for a number of other clubs, including a short, short comeback from Argate in 1991. I was playing for the Corinthian Casual Vets. I've got to say this, up to the age of 53, you scored... An amazing 280 goals from 228 appearances. I mean, there seems to be no holding back a top goal scoring marksman. It does there, Peter, really. 53. I mean, incredible. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I love I loved my time playing for the Corinthian Casuals because yes. it, it the ethos, the ethos of the club, I mean it's still um it's still an amateur side now. They're playing in the sort of Isthmian leagues or whatever, but they are, the yes. ethos of the club they was to, um, I suppose, demonstrate that the gentlemanly way football should, used to be played and should be played. And we used to play a lot of the public schools around around the country. Um, and I always used to joke that every year, <laughs> the, the, the kids are the same age, but every year we're a year older. Um, <laughs> but it, it was a fantastic experience. And, you know, there were a few ex, ex uh semi-pro players that had played you know in in the sort of semi-pro leagues uh, and a couple of every now and again you'd have a an ex ex player come as well i mean one one week we had um alan pardew playing for us 
another week. Um, uh, what was I thinking of? Uh, we'd have a, a Alex Stewart playing mm. the cricketer. Um, you know, we had some some guest appearances by some top sportsmen, and uh, wonderful. It was just fantastic. And during that time, we also went on tour to uh, Brazil, South Africa. Um, we went uh, to uh, Moscow. Wow, some international travel too. Yeah, I mean, and I, and I sort of, I just love those trips. You know, it's fantastic. We were. We were treated, you know, like royalty, especially in Brazil, because mm. um, the Corinthians in Brazil, now in Sao Paulo, yes. they were formed from the Corinthians of England. Wow, what a great story. In 1910, a team called the Corinthians used to be in a, a top amateur club in the country, and they went out to Brazil on a football tour, and they, they played against some Brazilians who then formed the Corinthians who went on to become this team now that plays in the Bra Brazilian first. Yeah. They're a huge Brazilian. team in Brazil, aren't they? Corinthians. Yeah. So and, and fantastic. I mean, when we went there, we were guests of the, of the club. So, you know, just fabulous experiences and which, which were a real bonus as you get, you know, later on in your, in your oh. sort of career and your life. I often say, uh, you know, travel um, is, is the best form of uh, investment really. So you're getting it at the back end of your career. That's fantastic. What, what wonderful countries to visit and, yeah. and, and plan a game you love. I mean, you retired as a football player at the age of 33 and took up coaching on the youth development programme at Wimbledon Football Club. I mean, how did you take up to, how did you take to the coaching side of football? Well, Very different, was, isn't it? I, yeah, I was, I was part-time at Wimbledon. Um, I, I had a very, I had a good job outside of football in, in terms of, I went into sports management initially um, I went back to, funnily enough, I went back to uh, college and did a, a postgraduate business diploma. And um, I became, a, I got a job as a leisure centre manager and um, gradually progressed to being a contracts manager and then uh, operations director for a leisure management side. But it allowed me as well to have time to coach as well so I coached at Wimbledon for about 10 years when they were in the Premier League yeah wow. well managed, managed the under 13s under 14s under 15s and you know I was I was there when they were the, the crazy gang, gang. <laughs> and, and it was a it was a great club I've got to say you oh know, it, yes it, it wasn't like um it wasn't rigid it wasn't too structured um <laughs> it was full of almost mavericks you know yeah Billy like, Jones I, Dennis yeah. Wise oh the list is endless. Yeah, yeah, good. I loved, I loved coaching the kids. You know, I think mm. um, because I never used to, you know, personally, I, perhaps I was a bit soft, too soft, which is why I probably wouldn't have made a good football manager. Um, but I used to always, I look, used to look at some of the the lads and especially the, the black kids, because some of them, I used to talk to them and I'd find out that they, you know, their their dad wasn't at home and that. Oh, you sad. Know, and that, that I used to find out about their family life. And so mm. I used to always try and take that into consideration. And, and it helped motivate a lot of them that they could come and talk to someone, you know, that would, yeah. you know, and I really enjoyed it. And some of the lads, um, I mean, Joby McEnough, who's, who played at Orient and is now on Sky, um, he was one of the lads I brought through in those three those three years. And... You know, it was just a wonderful experience. They were great kids, and Wimbledon had a great youth setup. So oh, yeah, really enjoyed it. Fantastic to hear. Fantastic and, and to hear. Whenever I had any other time, I was playing uh, charity games for the TV commentators eleven, <laughs> and, uh, and playing for the uh, the Corinthian Casuals. So you know, that, you know, I tried to keep myself as fit as possible. Of course. And quite rightly so too. And then in your book, The Gold Gourmet, the title of this show, of course, author Nielsen Hoffman, I think I pronounced his name right, captures the life and times of your illustrious footballing career, Peter, which is about which is about one of the most prolific goal scorers outside of the Premier League. The book features tributes and contributions from TV commentators, former managers, fans and friends, and former teammates with over 100 photographs. 
There's also a full statistical record of one of the greatest players ever to pull on a Doncaster Rovers and Leighton Orient shirt. Yes, you, Peter. Oh, that's a great book, isn't it? So yeah. apart from Doncaster Rovers and Leighton Orient football club shops, where, where else can supporters and interested individuals purchase the Gold Gourmet book? Let's um, give it a bit well, of a push. Yeah, it's, it's available on Amazon. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I mean, we when we did the first launch, um, it was it was with uh, a, a Derwent Press, I think it was, when Neil and I did the first book. Um, but Derwent Press, I think they sold up and then disappeared uh, a few years back. And so I did a, a reprint because I was getting a lot of people asking me for that. Mm. So I did a reprint and that on myself. Um, so it was limited to the uh, Doncaster and Orient club shops. And as I say, Amazon. So it's Brilliant. still available on Amazon uh, if anyone would like to buy a copy. Well, I'd recommend going out to buy it. I'm sure it's a fabulous book and from a, from a fantastic football player. So uh, definitely, definitely worth a purchase, I would say. And uh, what other interests do you have outside of football, Peter? We're sort of coming to the end of the show now. Crikey. Yeah, I'm well, I'm, I try and keep myself as fit as possible. I can't hmm. I can't jog anymore because I played in a charity match about seven years ago and tore my knee, my knee meniscus. Oh. And I'd never had a serious injury before. But, so I had an operation. It didn't work. So I now cycle um, three well or four times a week to try and keep myself fit. Um, but my 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 main uh passion shall i say is 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 traveling yes um, and i try to get away and do things as often as possible and i'm also very very interested in in the great war wow um i i in fact you know it became popular in football for the football authorities to start sort of building mon mon memorials and that uh in I think 2010. Well, I've mm. been visiting the Somme battlefields since 1980. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's incredible. You know, and I I sort of got a library of of books on the Great War. I find it a fascinating thing. It was such a pivotal right, right, thing so. in, in society at the time. Um, and I'm I'm patron of the Old Somme Memorial Fund, which is a, a fund that I set up with. Um, Steve Jenkins, who's the vice chairman of the Supporters Club. Yes. Steve Steve was researching a story of Clapton Orient's footballers in the Great War, and he knew that I go to the Somme and the Ypres and, you know, the different battlefields. Mm. And so we got chatting and he, he said, would I help him with, with his book? So I wrote the foreword and helped him promote Fantastic. and launch it. And then him and I set up this SOM fund in 2009 and the intention of building a permanent memorial to the Clapton Orient footballers of 1914. What a cracking who, idea. Who were the, who were the first foot, professional footballers to enlist, English footballers to enlist into the army. Mm. And they 11 players uh, enlisted um, and three, three were, were killed in the, in the Battle of the Somme. And uh, I had a, I, because of my many trips to France, I, I knew the mayor of Fleurs and uh, some other mm -hmm. people in, in the various towns. And we managed to get them to agree to give us a piece, a plot of land in their village. And we raised about 20 grand to have the memorial built, which we unveiled in 2011. And in 2021, we unveiled a memorial, similar memorial at the National Arboretum in Staffordshire Wonderful. to the Captain Orient footballers. So, so I've been sort of quite passionate about that. And uh, we're still obviously promoting the story and, uh, and uh, in doing as much as we can to, to, to help promote the, you know, the footballers in the Great War, really. Quite rightly so too. My grandfather was in the Battle of the Somme. Um, and he did get mustard gassed, actually. Um, mm. But somebody, one of his comrades, pulled him out of a, a rat hole, a rabbit hole. And he survived. But, of course, uh, he, he was in Portsmouth of Hospital for about six months. I think he was temporarily blind for that time. Um, but he survived. He became, 
who wasn't an accountant, became a part-time fireman in order shop and lived about 88 years of age. So, you know, wow. there's testament to the great man. Fantastic. Yeah. Amazing, amazing, isn't it? So uh, I wouldn't be sitting here now if it wasn't for me to perish. So, you know, that's a, a, a good thing, really. But, yeah, uh, that's an amazing thing to do. It's a great passion, Peter, isn't it? The Great War. Uh, yeah, I find, I, I think it's, it really is good. And it's it's great to actually bring um, to bring it to younger people as well, to, to, to know what happened in these. Exactly. Things. I mean, um, at Orient, we, we've this this coming up this July because of our involvement with the story, we've managed to get Leighton Orient uh, to agree to play a friendly with Heart of Midlothian in July. Mm. Because Heart of Midlothian and a, and a number of other Scottish clubs, they were the first Scottish footballers to enlist in 1914. Oh, amazing. Uh, and so we've managed to get the two clubs to agree to play a pre-season friendly in July. Brilliant. Um, and hopefully, you know, that should be quite a high-profile game. Mm. And we've also got a youth tournament in France at the end of August uh, for the Orient youth team are playing over there with against Lingfield from Ireland okay. and from uh, a couple of teams in France. So, you know, we're, we're trying to bring the story as much as we can into the into the public eye. And, uh, you know, we've been very successful in that and, I, and I'm very pleased with the work we've done. Yeah, credit to you. Absolute credit to you, Peter, for, for that. That's fantastic. You have to let me know the date of that match against Hearts um, uh, at uh, Brisbane Road because um, I am away, it's actually. Up, it's up in Edinburgh. It's, uh, it's, it's up in, in at Heart of Middle Odeon's ground. Oh, wonderful. It's, it's also their 150th anniversary, so they wanted to utilise that game as part of their celebrations. Are you going? I will be, yes. I'll be there. Brilliant. So let me know when it is, because I know I'm away for the first two weeks in July, but actually, you know, I'm back for the second two weeks and uh, I'd like to come up and, and, and watch. Have a, have a big yeah, yeah, it should be Wonderful. a fantastic occasion. Great stuff. Let me know the date. Anyway, we are literally an hour and 15 minutes, in fact, okay. over. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, what a great chat we've had here. It's been amazing. It's truly... It's funny uh, because I said, I said to uh, my partner, Catherine, before, she said, how long will you be? I said, well... I'm I'm not like Terry Cur T C Terry Curran. I said he can talk, he can talk <laughs> for England, and I noticed I noticed you interviewed him uh, yes. last month, and he was on for about an hour and a half. There he was, brilliant. <laughs> and Great I said, no, I'll be I'll be finished in about an hour. No. So so. Well, you're about <laughs> an hour. And got, nobody now. can talk as much as T C. He certainly can <laughs> talk. What a lovely fellow he is to a great man. T C. He is isn't a he? wonderful chap. Top bloke, yeah. Top top footballer, top man. Brilliant guy. So, could you mind staying on whilst I wrap up? Uh, we'll have a quick chat afterwards, particularly about yeah. Heart of Melovian and Orient as well. That's yeah, a fantastic no problem, match. No problem. Brilliant, thank you. As always on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show, we could talk forever, Peter, about your life and amazing life in professional football. It's been a huge pleasure as always, and as always, the pleasure is all mine. And of course, the show's audience, when this podcast is released on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show and the Lord Russell Baker YouTube channel. Thank you, Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Peter Kitchen a huge round of applause. Fantastic story. Great show. It really is. Thank you, Russell. Really enjoyed talking to you. Oh, likewise. The next episode on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show is Olympic Flame from Olympia where my special guest will be Lance Haggith, who is the founder of the Sports Trader Charity in the UK and winner of the 2010 BBC Sports Personality of the Year Unsung Hero Award. Oh, incredible. Lance Haggith was a Royal Navy reservist for six years and a National League basketball player and coach. Lance Haggith was appointed Officer of the Order of the British Empire, OBE, in the 2022 birthday honours for charitable and voluntary services to vulnerable people, particularly during COVID-19. So another exciting show to look forward to on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show, available, of course, on all podcast media platforms and the Lord Russell Baker YouTube TV channel. And of course, I'm looking forward to seeing you all on the inside. So until then, it's au revoir from him and au revoir from me.